All right, new card reveal. A little later here because I'm waiting on a uh, certain someone, former world champion, to reveal their scheduled card. But I guess we're going to go on without it. So uh, we've got an insane Demon Hunter card here. A lot to talk about this one. A couple new legendaries. Some pretty cool designs across the board for dual class stuff. So let's go ahead and jump into it. Hey, buddy, watch this. All right, so let's talk about Glide here. A new Demon Hunter card. It's four mana. And it reads, shuffle your hand into your deck and then draw four cards. Outcast, your opponent does the same. And uh, I, I don't know. I think this card is crazy. Um, so let's just talk about how this works, right? Let's say you're Demon Hunter. You've emptied your hand because you're playing hyper aggressive. You've had Glide sitting there the whole game. So it's naturally outcasted. It's your last card. This is sort of like a mini divine favor, right? You are shuffling your empty hand into your deck and you're drawing four cards. Now, this is not like plot twist where you're drawing the same amount of cards. So you can go from an empty hand to four cards in hand. So it is upside if you're playing it from an empty hand. If you have four cards in hand, it's kind of like a, a retry, like a mulligan basically in your hand trying to find the right stuff, which could be relevant if you don't have burst damage and you're looking for like metamorphosis or cane or whatever it is, right? You could use that to find a bunch of twin slices too. So that's one use case. But I think more importantly is the case where you're out of cards, you use this as a small divine favor refill. It's not as big as divine favor because maybe you're not drawing eight or nine or 10, but four is often enough to get you re-going, get you flowing again and create another surge of pressure, right? Which might help you win the game because you've already exhausted your hand. Now, the crazy part for me is you're going to force your opponent to do the same because this is like always going to be outcasted when you play it. I don't think you're ever playing this when it's not outcasted. So if your opponent has a full hand, if they're like a control deck or, you know, the quest warlock that has managed to gain uh, nine, 10 cards in hand, right? You're going to force them to shuffle their deck in, shuffle their hand into their deck they're only going to redraw four cards. So you're basically going to remove six cards from their hand sometimes. More likely you remove like three to four cards from a control deck's hand, which is sort of absurd because that's really going to check their ability to answer your cards. They're going to have way less options. They're going to lose combo pieces. And they're going to have to start over redrawing all those things that they've drawn, which just seems completely bonkers to me. Like that's so much disruption to your opponent's game plan if they're a control deck. Now, naturally, if you're playing this against another aggro deck who also has an empty hand, you're also going to make them draw four cards, uh, which is, is clearly a downside. You're going to make them draw four cards, but maybe you could control that so it doesn't happen against an aggro deck if this isn't outcasted but again i think it's usually going to be outcasted but you could store like one small cheap spell in the outcast spot on the far left if you're playing against an aggro deck cast glide and then cast your small spell so you have a little bit of control maybe if you know the matchup really well so insane upside against um control decks or decks with a lot of cards in hand uh, probably a downside against aggro decks, but one that might be mitigated. And I think just a huge upside on the card itself for you taking an empty hand and turning it into a full hand. Now we don't know that every demon hunter deck would want to run that necessarily. Maybe they aren't running out of cards. Maybe that's not an issue with things like skull of gold Dan, but you could shift this in a direction where if you wanted to play that super face style, run out of gas, rely on glide to reload, and it's probably going to work really nicely, especially if you're worried about your opponent having stuff. This could also be a combo counter. So do I think like every Demon Hunter automatically runs this? Not necessarily. I think that maybe Skull of Gul'dan's enough to keep things moving. It seems like Demon Hunter was getting there before, and this might be overkill or unnecessary in those situations because it certainly doesn't have anything like a discount. But, but, you know, we've seen Divine Favor do nightmare stuff in the past. I think Glide is very similar in function in a lot of ways, and it technically even has additional upside in some cases, although, of course, limitations as well. So I, I think the card's really strong, potentially. It, it seems like it could be very frustrating to play against as well. If you go from nine-card hand with Alex Draza, Maligos, and you go instead to a four-card hand with, like, a couple plot twists, it's going to feel like a nightmare in those scenarios unless maybe it helps you finish your quest. I guess you might be a little bit happier in that case. But I, I just – this card is completely bonkers to me from a mechanic standpoint. I – I'm worried it's more frustrating than fun, but I guess uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But 
Uh, it's something else for sure. All right, Ace Hunter Crean, new dual class legendary for Demon Hunter and Hunter, of course, based on Hunter Ace World Champion. Three mana, two, four. Your other characters are immune while attacking. So whether it's your hero attacking or other minions, they're not going to take damage. And uh, this is an effect we've seen kind of in the past with a minion that gave single units immune uh, for a turn. But this is everything on board that's yours, which obviously offers way more upside at exactly the same cost. <laughs> and in particular, you can see this making a lot of sense with, say, rush minions. You play this alongside a rush minion. It trades in. Boom, you're good. If you're ahead on board, which both Demon Hunter and Hunter tend to be, you might already have some minions left over. Uh, they can, can attack on the following turn. You slam this. They can take a great trade, run into an explosive trap, they won't care. Also, of course, both classes with a lot of weapons and face attacks, particularly Demon Hunter with like Warglaves of Azanoth, if that's still gonna stay meta relevant at six mana. Seems like maybe not, but let's consider it is. And they get to attack with impunity. It's like having a blur where you don't take any damage at all. They could wipe an entire board thanks to Ace Hunter Crean. So certainly a handful of different applications here. And what that basically means is you're able to summon a minion that would otherwise have died or restore some health he would have otherwise taken for this three mana. So yeah, if you have like a King Crush on board that you need to trade into an 8-8 taunt, this is kind of like three mana summon a King Crush because your King Crush would have died. Instead, it lives. So you have a King Crush. Of course, it doesn't get to attack again or anything. So maybe charge is a bad example, but you get the idea. You get the extra stats from something that would have died and instead doesn't. And we think about it that way, like three mana to summon something big that would have died is pretty cool. Not to mention you get a pretty decent early game minion as well that sticks around on board and may have future upside and sort of a soft taunt because your opponent's like, God, I really got to deal with that. I can't have him taking more value trades with rush minions or saving more face health, whatever it is. So I think this is a perfect fit for both of these classes. It's not going to be the card that's like, you know, the star of a deck, you know, build your deck around it, but certainly fits well into both Highlander lists. And I think Demon Hunter can find a lot of ways to use this with face attacks, especially. So I don't see why you wouldn't make a little bit of room here for Ace Hunter Crean. Also just love the idea here of this Demon Hunter <laughs> using a bow and arrow. That's so cool. And I think those might be Warglaives that he's using as his bow. They tend to have a pretty similar shape. So pretty sick card here across the board. Certainly I think a playable competitive card has a lot of upside. So uh, both classes can use this one well. Moving on here to a mage legendary, it's Mozaki, Master Duelist. It's a five mana, three eight, and after you cast a spell, she gains spell damage plus one. So pretty nifty card here. First off, nice high health total at that five mana spot. I know from how often we've seen uh, the mage Malagos like just kind of linger around on board that uh, eight health is pretty sticky even on turn five. Now that said, of course, Malagos is a low priority card. This would be a much higher priority threat for your opponent. So they're more likely to find answers to this one, but still it's probably not super easy to deal with on turn five, although some decks won't have any trouble at all. So that does give you a little bit of long-term upside here. You can maybe play this naked on turn five, follow it up on turn six and have a pretty bonkers play either, you know, um, getting some nice face damage out, maybe just setting up for a better board clear, etc. Also, anytime this is randomly summoned, it's clearly going to make an impact on how games are played. But more importantly for this card, I think, is the what I'm going to call like the mini Malagos effect. I think you can probably use this in a combo deck pretty interestingly. Dropping something like a Sorcerer's Apprentice alongside it, not a huge commitment. If you have a handful of Ray of Frost one mana spells, you're going to be able to bump this to ridiculous spell damage totals, particularly with cards like Evocation or you could just keep refilling your hand. So as long as you have one, two mana spells, you might be able to get this up to easily Maligos levels of spell damage and probably even higher. Just Ray of Frosts, like two Ray of Frosts is already plus four spell damage. If you combine that with things like Frostbolt, another really cheap damage spell, this thing could pump out a ton of damage. Maybe it's not necessarily a game ending setup, but in something like a Mana Cyclone Tempo Mage, which is already kind of a thing or has been in the past at least, and I think even now APX Void still sort of plays that list some. This seems like it could be nuts as a late game follow-up. 
probably on in the vein of something like Archmage Antonitis, but perhaps even better in some ways because you might not need um, to spend as much mana on all those uh, recurring, you know, successive fireballs. Whereas this, you're just chaining one mana spells, zero mana spells. And, you know, you might be frostbolting for like 10, 12, 13 damage by the time you get through a turn of one mana spells with magic tricks, ray of frost, etc. So I can see some pretty crazy blow up possibilities with this one. Now, that said, I think this is exactly one of those cards that has a really high power level ceiling, like from a power level standpoint. When that turn goes off, that's like a five-star kind of card, right? It's deck-defining, game-winning. It could be amazing. But the likelihood of that deck succeeding is much, much lower. So you kind of have to hedge the review score here a little bit. Um, so, like, yeah, the power level's insane, but is that likely to happen? Is is that all going to line up? Is there a mage deck that's going to be able to pull all that together by turn seven, turn eight, and make it work? Probably not. So, um, and if it does, it's probably not a super consistent tier one sort of card. So... Although this card can do bonkers things, it's more likely that it doesn't ever really find that home. That's just a lot of commitment to that plan. So ultimately, I think this is more of a uh, fun, solid card that it's totally fine to include in a list here and there that has a bunch of cheap spells. It might set up some kind of crazy combo tempo mage, but probably doesn't and ends up falling a little bit short of any really significant competitive impact. Next appears Totem Goliath, a gigantic totem here for Shaman, a 5 mana 4 5, and it's got Death Rattle Summon, all four basic totems with an overload here of two. And uh, I, I actually think this card's kind of bonkers. We've already seen Totem Shaman finding some success in this meta, uh, which is nuts with cards like Totemic Reflection. Never expected that, but here we are. And I mean, I think a card like this fits totally fine as a mid game follow up. It seems like a lot of these totem lists kind of run out of gas in the mid game. We've seen the maybe Galacron package come in to supplement that a little bit. But a card like Totem Goliath could do that as well because there's just so many bodies, there's so much stats bundled into this singular card. So, yes, of course, the four five is understated for five mana. But four bodies being left behind, that's going to be really hard for a lot of decks to deal with. Like, unless they have the perfect AoE lined up with something on board to trade into Totem Goliath. By turn five, finding an answer to a fairly sizable minion and all those wide boards is going to be hard. So I think you're often going to be left with like three or four totems if your opponent kills this. Alternatively, they may decide not to kill it. They may be like, oh my god, I can't, I can't kill that. I can't give him... All these totems he's gonna have totemic reflection lined up just fine or whatever other kind of zero mana totem follow-up spell you have so i gotta leave it on board in which case you've got a minion that you can start to dictate trades with maybe you can still summon the totems by trading it in it's just gonna create a lot of awkwardness around how your opponent has to play into this card because almost never are they gonna be able to deal with it in like one fell swoop unless they commit you know transform polymorph etc so I think this actually offers a lot of upside and a lot of problems for people as a mid-game follow-up in any kind of totem-centric build. Frankly, even if it's not a totem-centric build, the four totems aren't bad cards, right? They do commit, you know, spell damage, which is nice. You get a 1-1, which is some nice stats. Uh, you get a taunt in the way, which can be good sometimes. So even if you're not running a specific totem list, this is just a big pile of stuff. And we know that Shaman can utilize wide boards particularly well. So any sort of token follow-up card, Bloodlust, anything like that, might be able to utilize this card too. So for me, this just looks like a really solid option across the board for what Shaman is all about, particularly a Totem Shaman. I think this card's gonna be way more frustrating than people realize to play against. Now the Overload of Two is noteworthy because you can't immediately follow this up with a Bloodlust if you're playing it on curve on five, because you're only gonna have four mana the turn after on your six mana turn. So that's a one small limitation here as far as like damage outputs concerned, but I think there's enough you can do with that follow up four mana in a totem build or otherwise that it's still worth it. And totems tend to kind of linger around anyway. And remember, that's not the only thing you're doing. You're going to be dumping more on board as well. So all in all, just I, I just like this card. I think it's really cool from a big flavor standpoint and um, just a perfect fit for what Shaman's all about. And maybe finally the best like totem centric card that plays with all the different basic totems we've ever seen. All right, moving on to Ceremonial Maul. We've got a dual class Paladin and Warrior weapon. And we see the new um, framing on the weapons here. It's going to show the class colors there in the background instead of in the um, text box, which is a really nice change, I think. It's a 3-minute 2-2 two -two spell burst. Summon a student with taunt. 
and stats equal to the spell's cost. So you equip this presumably around turn three. You're not unhappy. We've seen two two weapons be totally fine at that spot. And instead of doing something like generating a lackey, like Livewire Lance, or drawing a pirate for the warrior comparisons, or uh, Underlight Angling Rod, perhaps for Paladin right now, where you're generating a Murloc, most of these are about resources in hand. This card instead will be about stats on board, slightly more tempo favored. But of course, you have to follow it up with a spell in order to achieve that. So it's not immediate tempo, it's delayed or banked tempo for a future turn. So it's kind of anti-tempo in a way too, because it's going to take a little bit of time to enact it, which can be good, I think, and it can be bad. So for instance, you play this on three, you hit a minion. It's kind of cool here that the spell burst is a tad more resilient than many of the other spell burst minions we've seen, where if you tried to play them preemptively on board, it's very likely your opponent will kill them. Of course, there's weapon removal in Hearthstone that can deny the spell burst here, but often you can bank one of these durabilities to utilize the spell burst in the future, which is nice compared to minions when that does work. So you play it on three, you attack, you're happy, turn four, you follow it up with hopefully maybe a spell and you get a four, four, which ultimately, you know, if this was a three mana two, two that said summon a four, four, you'd be over the moon. So if that's the result. I think, you know, on curve, you're pretty happy to get those stats and play right away. So there are some four mana spells, especially in Paladin, who's got a billion that seem to fit really nicely into that game plan. Also, you could wait until later and you could play this with like brawl. We know that uh, spell burst goes off after the spell finishes. So, for instance, if you brawl, it's going to resolve the brawl, then it's going to summon you a 5-5 with taunt, which could be a really nice way uh, to flip a board back in your favor or at least back to parity if your opponent wins the brawl. Uh, and, you know, there are plenty of other even bigger spells for both of these classes that you can start to do some pretty fun stuff with, summon you a nice 7-7 with taunt later in the game. So I do see some upside there. I think the challenge, right, is, is this weapon better than others? Uh, I don't know because sometimes those resources in hand are nice. We know that like Ankar is amazing getting risky skippers. Livewire Lance seems really powerful too. And I mean, the three attack on Underline Angling Rod is quite a bit of upside over the Ceremonial Mall as well. So are you willing to give up some of that quicker advantage for the boost down the line of a minion on board? Maybe, yeah, maybe, but if you don't have a spell handy or if you want to play a minion instead, it's like it's going to take you maybe two, three, four turns to get anything out of your ceremonial mall, and that can be problematic because you're not able to use that second durability on board, so you're only kind of getting half of the weapon value, so you're stalling out the weapon attack itself as well, which is another big downside. So there are upsides, there are downsides, and that just kind of means it's going to depend on the deck, it's going to depend on the needs of the specific archetype that's trying to run it. I think it's more likely to see play in Warrior than in Paladin particularly, because Paladin already has quite a few good weapons to choose from. I mean, I guess Warrior does too, but I think Warrior is a slightly more defensive game plan right now and um, will value the big statted taunt more alongside things like Brawl and bigger spells, even like Dimensional Rippers or something could play into Warrior as well. So um, I think it's about the same in both though. Just totally fine, a solid inclusion, but it's not necessarily gonna reshape anything or redefine how we see these classes right now. Just might pop into a list here and there that's you know somewhat competitive. Next up here is Flesh Giant, dual class card for Priest and Warlock, an eight mana, eight, eight, and it costs one less for each time your hero's health changed during your turns. So note that this is not the amount of health that changed, it's each instance of the health changing. So for hero powers with either class that typically do two damage or heal two health, this will not change the cost by two, it would only change the cost by one. So it takes eight hero powers if you want Flesh Giant to go down to zero mana, not four. Um, similarly, any kind of renew or whatever, same story. And um, just want to clarify that first. Now that said, it's a little bit hard for me at least to picture how quickly this is going to get discounted. I can imagine in scenarios like Warlock with things like Flame Imps and all these self damage cards, particularly in wild format, but we focus on standard for reviews. I think it get discounted pretty quickly just because you're taking so many instances of damage. Just a couple Flame Imps, a hero power that starts getting down cheap by the mid game by turns like three four five it starts looking like it could be playable particularly around turn four turn five i think is when this is most common and it will probably be a three to five mana eight eight is that good enough is my question and i don't actually know that it is i know that we've had mountain giant in the past be a pretty relevant and dominant card 
I don't know that Mountain Giant would be as good today in Hearthstone, uh, just because we're in this crazy Zephyrus world where all these Shadow War deaths are just out, just right there at a moment's notice. If you need them, you can grab them. So that's one thing. Uh, otherwise, just, you know, this doesn't have Taunt or Rush or anything. So it is just a big bomb of stats, which can be good in Zoo, but would Zoo rather just like have a Sea Giant? Would that actually be cheaper given how many minions are on board all the time in the game right now? maybe sea giant would be cheaper on average now of course sea giant's not as good as like a top deck because if you hit this on turn 10 you're trying to reload it's almost always going to be zero mana and that's great you can dump it in and um, play whatever other thing you want so you know i i guess i'm saying a lot here but not saying much and th the challenge for me is what deck is running this is it a zoo deck right are they trying to play this really early in the game for the big stat bump okay maybe that works maybe sea giant's better um mountain giant never got played in zoo but that's because you had a hand size restriction this doesn't so maybe it's totally fine uh is a control deck wanting to play this is like a big swing later in the game like priest who's playing all these renews and hero powers and stuff i don't think so because i don't think the stats will matter as much there i think priest is happy as they are i don't think they'd make room for a card like this so i think it has to be a more aggressive deck i think zoo is the most likely outcome or at least an aggressive self damage type warlock i don't know if this increments much to their game plan right now because it's not a self damage card. If you didn't hit the nuts, if you weren't rolling well, this could sit dead in hand for a while, and that's hard for Zoo decks to do. They like having consistent plays. Plus, this could break discard stuff if it hits your hand and it's still expensive, or if you're trying to play like a turn two uh, discard on a hand of Gul'dan and this still costs eight mana, that's a risk as well. So essentially, Yes, I see that this is going to be a zero mana 8-8. Eight, eight. Yes, I know zero mana cards historically in Hearthstone have been nuts. But my question is, is this more like Sea Giant or is this more Jumbo Imp? And I think right now I'm leaning that it's a little bit more Jumbo Imp, which just didn't get there. But it's only eight mana, so it's somewhere in between. So ultimately, this card's very, very hard to assess. We talked about this for like 20 minutes on stream yesterday as well when it got revealed. I'm going to say it's fine. I think it's totally possible. I do not think it's game breaking. I don't think it's terrible. I could envision a deck here or there running it, but I think it's primarily going to be in Warlock, mostly not in Priest. Although the way the world works these days, it's probably going to end up the exact opposite. So in other words, a totally fine card. Moving on here to Cabal Acolyte, a new Priest minion, four mana, two, six with Taunt and Spellburst, gain control of a random enemy minion, with two or less attack. Now, uh, just a little clarification here. There was some footage of this card uh, that was showcasing when it stole the minion, the minion would be able to attack immediately, a la Shadow Madness. It has been confirmed by Blizzard that is not true. This does operate exactly like Cabal Shadow Priest. The stolen minion will be unable to attack unless it has like rush or charge or whatever. Uh, but normally it will be unable to attack. So it's exactly like Cabal Shadow Priest, except of course it's spell burst and it's a random enemy minion with two or less attack and, you know, different costs, etc. So is this card any good? Well, uh, Cabal Shadow Priest has been a fine card historically in Hearthstone, still shows up even today a little bit, which is a good sign for a card like that. I actually think Cabal Acolyte is notably worse though than uh, Cabal Shadow Priest. It is a taunt, which is nice, and it's cheaper, which is nice, but the spell burst aspect here that's demanding that you follow it up with some secondary card is the real limitation for me because often this is probably going to come down around like turn five or six, much like a Cabal Shadow Priest would, and it demands that you have a spell ready. So if you don't have a spell ready, if you just want to play a four drop and hero power, or if you just want to play a taunt body, often the spell burst is not going to activate because your opponent's absolutely going to prioritize killing this, and it's not going to be hard because it has taunt. It's not going to be hiding behind anything. Of course, six health on turn four is a little bit awkward to deal with, but it's certainly not impossible these days, uh, as we've seen many, many times. So turn four, maybe not the best play. Of course, you could have some zero mana cards. Lazul's scheme comes to mind in particular. That could be a pretty sneaky shenanigan, but that's like a shenanigan. It requires a card that we're not seeing much right now. It feels like it wouldn't be that powerful in the early game, so... I don't know about that. So that's problem number one. If you come down in the mid game, the fact that it's a random minion with two or less attack actually does matter, I think, because often there's that one specific thing you're hoping to grab, right? Like I want that little taunt or the little lifesteal. I don't want the one, one lackey. And we've got lackeys everywhere. So this is always going to steal a lackey randomly instead of the thing that you actually care about. So it's like convincing infiltrator next to a one, one. What am I going to get? I'm going to get the one, one instead of the convincing infiltrator. It's like, <laughs> you just know how often that's going to backfire. 
50% of the time in that instance. So I think the randomness is an issue. I think the delayed impact is an issue compared to a battle of cry. The one upside is the cost and the taunt aspects, which can be good in a defensive deck. If you're just looking to play a taunt, don't even care about the spell burst. You might not be totally unhappy to do this, but then you'd probably just rather have a bone wraith in that instance, right? So does this get played over bone wraith? Does this get played over cabal shadow priest? Uh, in both instances, I'd have to say, uh, I don't know about that. So for me, it's like, yeah, there's upside. It's probably okay, but I just don't think this is good enough to make the cut over other cards. Just a little bit of awkwardness, a little bit of delay, a little bit of randomness, all playing against it that's going to make people cut it sooner than they're happy to play it. Glide is a four-star card. Mozaki Master Duelist is a three-star card. Totem Goliath is a four-star card. Ceremonial Maul is a three-star card. Flesh Giant is a three-star card. Cabal Acolyte is a three-star card. Ace Hunter Crean is a four-star card. And there you go, folks. That wraps it up for uh, this here review. Uh, if that Fireback card is a legendary, I guess I'll probably come back and do another review, frankly. Uh, I'm not sure what to expect. If it's not a legendary, I'll probably bundle it into the next one. But thanks for hanging out. Uh, in this review, share your thoughts on these cards. Is Glide, like, totally insane, or do you think it's okay? What do you think about these legendaries? Share all those thoughts in the comments below. Thanks much for watching. I hope you'll subscribe to the channel. And until next time, game on.